director of the Redwood Library, and I want to welcome you to a very special evening. Um, we're thrilled to be hosting this event uh, with uh, Preserve Rhode Island because we ourselves are committed to preserving Rhode Island, of course. Um, and I should mention that this topic, not only is it fascinating on its own terms, but it fits in with our special collection, of course, since I've been steadily buying books and trying to expand our historic holdings of uh, primary material on architecture, um, early modern. This is early, early modern, but uh, that's an elastic, you know, you've got people that study Renaissance art, I will tell you it's early modern, so we're, we're okay with the 17th century. Um, we're thrilled, of course, also because this is yet another collaboration uh, that in many ways celebrates our 275th, which we're celebrating this year in 2022. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Mr. Ed Kane for bringing us this whole uh, project. And uh, I also want to welcome uh, those attending virtually because we're live streaming this and uh, it's being watched by another 50 people. So uh, the audience uh, is here and there, and so we're thrilled to have them all. Um, now I would introduce Val Talmadge, ED of Preserve Rhode Island. I just met her a moment ago, and the one thing that I've been told is that she's beloved. <laughs> uh, and uh, despite her young years, she has uh, a lot of experience with uh, historic preservation. So. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, welcome, and I want to also welcome our speaker. So thank you very much. And oh, I should mention, after the presentation, there will be uh, a, a reception, and I will be giving a tour, uh, if you don't mind, of the treasures exhibition that we have in the gallery, which has some of our finest things. I, in my humble opinion, it might be worthwhile for some of you, so do join us. Thank you. Preservation Society. 
So you Newportonians, is that who you are, Newportonians? <laughs> um, you know that the, the stone walls on Aquidic Island are really a character-defining feature of the landscape. So check out the stone walls on the entrance road at Glen Farm and around Norman Bird Sanctuary. And stay tuned for more projects in the future because that Stonewall project is just really um, makes the landscape sing, and you'll be really proud to be on a good island. Preserve Rhode Island also speaks up for historic places in two different ways. We speak up for policy, and I think it was um, it was more than 10 years ago, as an example of this, that we helped the city of Newport with a major revamping of their local historic district ordinance. And then we also speak up for places, and we occasionally weigh in on controversial, controversial preservation issues in communities. We see ourselves as problem solvers, so we speak up when we think we can offer practical solutions and translate the sort of arcane preservation standards to common sense solutions. So we really try to have a voice around the state. Um, we're here today because um, Preserve Rhode Island took on a project in Lincoln, Rhode Island, and that opened the door to us to understand this, a style of historic buildings that is unique to Rhode Island. Oh, did I, did I do that? Oh, but I'm, scared. I'm stealing your thunder. Come here and help us. Okay, we're good. All right. Um, Okay, sorry, I, I screwed up Shanti's presentation already, so um, so she can now relax because I made the error, right? <laughs> um, okay, so we took on this project in Lincoln, Rhode Island, and that really opened us up to understand uh, this building type of the example that you see here. This is the Valentine Whitman House in Lincoln that we uh, believe was constructed about 1696, and you can see why it's called a stone enter. Um, we took, on, we took title to this property last year because it um, had been owned by the town of Lincoln who had been managing, or more like neglecting, this property for 30 years. They, they actually had rescued the building from the jaws of the developer 30 years ago, stood up and bought the property. And then being a town, they didn't know what to do with it. They had um, a group of friends who ran a house museum in it without any resources or knowledge or capacity to really do that. And it was a place that was really on a death spiral. The, the town hadn't invested in this building for basically for 30 years. And so they, um, they had the brilliant idea to unload it to us. <laughs> so we took about um, two or three years to look, as I say, that gift house in the mouth <laughs> to see whether or not we could possibly take on that this kind of a project. And we decided that we would do it on the condition that we were not going to create a house museum in this place. A house museum would not, it, it, just, it wasn't, wasn't economical. You would never get the kind of traffic that you would need in order to sustain an historic building. So we did it. We did it with the understanding of the town that we would only take the project on if we could activate the place. So in the last year, we invested upwards of six hundred thousand dollars to rehab the property from top to bottom, and we just last month conveyed it to a new private owner who is in love with the place. They are pinching themselves to think that they own such a fabulous historic building in Rhode Island, and we, as Preserve Rhode Island, hold a preservation easement on the property that permanently guides its preservation and will make sure that the building is, is on its pathway for its next 300 years. So what does this project in Lincoln have to do with Newport and why are we here tonight? I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, we're just grateful to the Kay Wallace Foundation for uh, allowing us to indulge in our curiosity about the building type that exists here in Newport as well as Lincoln and in other communities in Rhode Island. Why Stone Enders? What does that Stone End do? Why only in Rhode Island? And uh, with the foundation's support, we asked preservationist extraordinaire, Shantia Underhagen, to peel back the onion a bit and to give us a peek into the history of Stone Enders. She answered some questions, and as a good researcher, uncovered many more questions that she couldn't answer that leads us to the need for further study. 
So this research project is an example of Zymergy's first law of evolving system dynamics. Once you open a can of worms, <laughs> the only way to recan them is to use a larger can. <laughs> so we need that larger can to expand. So someone needs to have a larger can to expand the scope of work to understand why stone enders are a building type that we find only in Rhode Island. We're going to hear about Shanti's findings and all the questions yet to find those answers. So thanks, Shanti, for doing this research for us. And I'm sorry I asked for that response. <laughs> Thanks very much, Val, um, and thanks to Preserve Rhode Island and the Redwood Library and Athenaeum for tonight's opportunity. Um, and thank you to any number of people who um, I consulted with along the way over the few months I was working on this because indeed it does take a village. Um, some um, <coughs> of them are here, actually one of them is here, Ron Rod. Thank you very much, Ron, for your help as I picked your brain. Um, so stone enders an early American architectural uh, style, actually. Um, my name is Shantia Anderhagen, and I'm here tonight to talk with you about this building type uh, called the Stone Ender. But first, why me? Well, I grew up liking old New England things. I grew up in New England. I grew up in South County, right across the um, bay here. I went to the University of Rhode Island, uh, where I learned that um, studying and start buildings could actually be a career. I then went to Boston University where I had the great good fortune to work with a number of people, including Richard Candy, who were studying the earliest buildings in New England. And we'll hear a little bit more about those um, as I move through my, my talk. Uh, let me just adjust the font. So I began my preservation career at the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities in Boston, which is now historic New England. And after many years at SPNEA, I worked, I worked in three uh, additional capacities. At the local level here in the city of Newport as the city's first full-time historic preservation planner. Uh, nationally, I worked in the law division at the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Washington, administering easements uh, for that organization's program was a portfolio of 125 preservation and conservation easements across 25 states. And then back in Newport at the Newport Restoration Foundation as their director of preservation for a couple of years. Um, uh, I'm now a historic preservation consultant um, working across New England. And in that role, I've been very, very lucky uh, to say that Preserve Rhode Island has engaged me on some very interesting projects and when I received the call uh, several years ago, um, asking for my perspective on the Valentine Whitman House in Lincoln, I was ecstatic. I had long heard of the Valentine Whitman House, but hadn't ever had a chance to visit it. Uh, as Val mentioned, it's in Lincoln, Rhode Island. It was constructed in circa 1696. We debated four and six, but the historic structure support says six, and I clearly have four stuck in my mind um, a one or two years. Long recognized as a very good example of a Rhode Island stone ender. As Val mentioned, it had been town-owned for 30 years, and the town and Preserve Rhode Island were partnering for a new future for the house. PRI, as Val mentioned, was seriously considering this prospect and asked me to help with some due diligence. For several years, PRI worked through the process of developing a sustainable new plan for the Valentine Whitman House, one that would um, ensure the protection of the very special features of this important house, um, but allow it to be rehabilitated to provide comfortable and modern living. Fast forward to 2022, with the rehabilitation well underway and the organization finalizing the final plan for the property's future, as Val mentioned, it would be sold with a preservation, uh, perpetual preservation easement, a curatorial level of interior and exterior protection that achieves the goal of preserving the building's 17th, 18th, 19th century architecture. But how to make sure that everyone understood how important the Valentine Whitman House really is? 
PRI supported by a donor who was keen, also keen to learn more about the type of building that Valentine Women is, um, decided to take another look at what the, um, uh, in, the early, er, in the early 21st century, what we know about stone enders. That's the background of the project that you'll hear more about tonight. Before we get too much into the weeds, let's talk about what a stone ender is. The primary identifying feature of early Rhode Island buildings called stone enders are one entire wall of the building being constructed of stone, beginning at the below grade <coughs> foundation of one gable end wall. This creates a full side wall of stone that rises above the roof edges to become the building's stone chimney. So we have uh, beginning at the below the ground foundation, creates a side wall, entire side wall generally of stone that rises above the edges of the roof to become the building's stone chimney. In some of Rhode Island's established stone enders, and you'll hear more on that a bit, in terms of what an established stone ender is, this stone end remains an obvious architectural characteristic. In other examples, only part or even none in some cases of the stone end may still be visible. But let's talk back to the PRI project uh, and the state <coughs> work, which was relatively simple until it wasn't. It was to review the existing literature on Rhode Island stone enders, and that really was meant to be secondary literature. This wasn't a project of primary research. Um, it was also to review what's known about stone buildings in the immediately abutting states of Connecticut and Massachusetts, to create an inventory that assembles the information and literature citations of the buildings identified as stone enders, extant as well as demolished, to track down and photograph Rhode Island's extant stone enders. Really a lot of fun, actually, to go on that kind of fun. Consult with colleagues familiar with Rhode Island architecture for their knowledge about stone enders. And to research Rhode Island's early lime industry and the historic use of lime in Rhode Island. Three important things to know about this project. It was limited in time to approximately 70 hours over four months. It might have been a little more like 80 hours, but it wasn't, this was not a year long or four year long or many decade project. This was a short term project to take a quick look at what we know uh, in 2022. The project did not include any first hand field work beyond confirming from the street that buildings were extant, that is standing. And it revealed that there is more to learn about some of the extant buildings that have been identified. And I should say here at this juncture that um, I am a visual person and I like slides and I probably have way too many slides. So I'm just gonna warn you, there are many, many slides and I may move through some of them quickly to try to keep us a bit on time. Um, so reviewing the existing literature was the first step. Rhode Island is very fortunate to have, some, to have had some very good early work done on its early buildings. I'm going to take you on a quick historiographical tour of those works, those early works on Rhode Island's early architecture. That is the who and the what. The first stop is generally Norman Morrison. Eichen was a working architect as well as a teacher, he grew up mostly in Providence and attended Brown University, receiving an A.B. in 1886 and an A.M. in architecture in 1890. He later chaired the architectural department at the Rhode Island School of Design. He was a member of the American Institute of Architects and the Royal Institute of British Architects. Eichung, with Robert, excuse me, Albert Frederick Brown, published his early Rhode Island houses in 1895. And it's based on actual field work, going out and looking at what buildings are on the ground, so to speak. And further, it's important to understand that Eichung was looking at common buildings, vernacular buildings. 
he of course knew about significant historic buildings, one of which we're in, but he was looking at the early, um, earliest colonial buildings in a way that others were not. It was this uh, investigation of uh, physical fabric, or in many cases, what remained of a building um, and its earliest forms, in its earliest form and materials. And this is an example of the type of field work that was occurring under Aisham. Um, this is the House of the Seven Gables in Salem. It's from the Norman Aisham uh, collection and historic New England. Um, field work is now the norm when looking at historic buildings, um, not the exception. Um, but in the late 19th century, in fact, um, it, this was a relatively novel pursuit in terms of how to study buildings. Isham said at the time that he and Brown, and I quote, I'll get the font large enough, they hope that this work will be a help to future historians of New England and that it will promote the collection of scientific data about the oldest houses in the original New England colonies so that the vague descriptions of too many of our town histories may be supplanted by accurate measured drawings. And that he did. His books are full of measured drawings of the buildings that he was looking at. I show you the above publication, I show you the publication here, and again you'll hear more about it in old time, historic New England and old time New England in a minute, as evidence that Aisham was out and about. He was all over the state looking at as many early and or significant historic buildings as you can imagine. He was not only writing about his findings out in the field, but he was also very actively working on restoration projects on many of the buildings. Anyone studying historic buildings in Rhode Island also knows of the legendary Antoinette Downing. Moving here in 1932 with a degree from the University of Chicago and having studied architecture at Radcliffe College, Downey published the next seminal work after Isham on Rhode Island architecture in 1937. In 1952, Downing co-authored The Architectural Heritage of Newport, Rhode Island with Vincent Stolf. Downing worked tirelessly and effectively to understand and preserve Rhode Island's historic buildings until the end of the 20th century. Another really good resource uh, for studying early buildings is the Historic American Building Survey. HABs, along with the Historic American Engineering Record, HAIR, <coughs> are among the largest and most heavily used items in the print and photograph division of the Library of Congress. Beginning in 1933, these ongoing programs of the National Park Service have recorded America's built environment multi-format surveys comprising more than 580,000 measured drawings, large format photographs, and written histories for more than 43,000 historic structures and sites. Another really good resource is Rhode Island State Historic Preservation Office, now called the Rhode Island Historic Preservation and Heritage Commission. This office did, state office did very important work in the 1970s and 1980s. They surveyed, evaluated, and in many cases nominated significant historic building site structures, districts, and objects to the National Register of Historic Places. Every town in the state was inventory, and the resulting information was compiled in what were at the time state-of-the-art historic preservation publications for each town. These inventories are based on what we call reconnaissance surveys. They didn't enter every building, probably very few, and in some cases none. Um, the information was assembled as an initial first pass at describing what is <coughs> on the landscape, describing the physical form of buildings and including some amount of history, uh, but usually not a huge amount. These publications still form the basis of what we know about Rhode Island's 39 cities and 
and in many cases, stomach groups are described. Earlier, I mentioned field work. Um, Isham certainly did field work, but it is the Vernacular Architecture Forum, the VAF, that is the, or it is the VAF is the organization that imposes in the later 20th century, perhaps better stated, renewed rigor on the study of buildings and landscapes. It urges a much more careful examination of buildings and their and their contexts. Um, and again, this is an organization that is um, purposefully looking at the vernacular or common on the landscape and not the hugely significant, monumental, well-understood, well-studied buildings. In 2001, the VAF National Conference was held in Newport. And a couple of years prior to the conference, local architectural historians were very busy examining buildings found in the Narragansett Basin. This culminated in a three-part publication that describes the highlights of Rhode Island's built history from the perspective of the vernacularists. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention two other important people who contributed deeply to the study of early New England buildings, William Sumner Appleton and Abbott Lowell Cummings both of whom were long associated with SPNEA. If you can't see Abbott, there he is in front of the Brown House in Watertown, an early Massachusetts building. William Sumner Appleton founded SPNEA in 1910, and he too, like Isham, was out and about looking at, recording, corresponding about, and collecting historic New England buildings and actually many other objects as well. In the early 20th century, Appleton secured the purchase, excuse me, secured the ownership of two of Rhode Island's now well-established stone editors, the Arnold House in Lincoln and the Clements Irons House in Johnston. Appleton worked with numerous architects, including Isham, who played a role in the restoration of both Arnold and Clements Irons. Beginning his tenure at SPNEA in 1955, Abbott Wolf Cummings edited Old Time New England for a number of years. In 1970, he became the director of the organization. Old Time New England proved to be another good and reliable source of background information on some of Rhode Island's early buildings, although the amount of information is overwhelming, and I wasn't able to really dive into it as much as I uh, think is necessary. Cummings' highly significant contribution to our understanding of early buildings, however, was his 1979 publication, The Framing Houses of Massachusetts Bay. <laughs> this publication was the culmination of decades of Cummings' careful study of Massachusetts buildings and their connections to the places where colonists and builders came from. So going back to stone enders, what did we think we knew about stone enders? I checked in with a number of colleagues early in the process to pick brains and found myself relatively aligned with their understanding. They are a 17th century phenomenon unique to Rhode Island. There are less than a dozen standing and they occur predominantly in the northern part of the state. But what did the literature review reveal? So going back in time to Isham, in 1895, Isham lays out his understanding of the development of early Rhode Island buildings. He notes that Rhode Island's earliest buildings have stone end ends. And indeed, he mentions many buildings specifically, although not necessarily in great detail and not necessarily by the names we now know them by. Moving on to Down, four decades later, she pays homage to Isham and further elaborates on Stone Enders and specifically refers to those buildings as Stone Ender in her 1937 publication. She also mentions many buildings that are familiar to us 
calling them stone enders. I've already mentioned that the most recent literature and field work on historic Rhode Island buildings was done by the BAF in preparation for the 2001 National Conference. The Vernacular Architecture Forum identified 15 building types occurring in Rhode Island through the 18th century. Three of the 15 are described as stone ender types. Type A is a one room house comprised of a chimney mass that's exposed at the exterior and forms the majority or all of the gable end wall, quite like I described earlier in our talk. You may see a bake oven protrude from a masonry wall. Um, type D is the two room stone ender, and it's a one story building that may have begun as a single cell form or may actually have been constructed as a two room dwelling. Both of these types occur in the 17th and early 18th century. Type E is two rooms deep and two rooms wide and comes into fashion between 1675 and 1725. And this is the fully elaborated stone ender. This building type can be one and a half to two full stories in height. And these are the examples that remain for us to know as a stone ender. Valentine Whitman on the left, the Arnold House moving right, Clements Irons as the third, and then here in Newport, the elder John Bliss as the fourth. What are the origins of the stone ender? Colonial settlers, we're, we're gonna enter a period now with a lot of text because I didn't have good slides for these points. Colonial settlers constructing houses in New England were building from memory, using traditions and forms that were familiar to them depending on where they came from. And we know the vast majority came from England. Uh, there were a number of factors that influenced wh what and how they built, geography, economics, and climate influenced their choices. And over time, these choices resulted in the development of new building practices that accommodated the differences the builders found in New England compared to where they came from. Aisha recognized as early as 1895 that the character of architecture of the early colonies depend very closely on the artisans and the training they brought with them from the old world. Downing notes in 1937 that small buildings of similar construction have been found in Wales. Again, in her work in 1952 with Vincent Scully, Downing notes that there are surmises that builders from Sussex and Wales may have brought with them strong building, these strong building traditions. And vernaculars, Del Upton, Robert Blair, St. George, and other later 20th century architectural historians have continued to make important connections between certain characteristics of these early Southern New England buildings and construction practices in specific areas of England. And I should note in terms of vernacular, vernacularists, many of whom worked with Abbott Lowell Cummings, um, it's happening in somewhat parallel with his work on the Massachusetts Bay Colony <coughs> research that he was doing over in England um, to identify where builders and, and colonists had come from in an attempt to better understand the derivation of our New England buildings. And I must say, it trickled down to the Works Progress Administration 1937 book, Rhode Island, A Guide to the Smallest State, where there's a statement about the houses in Providence, almost the entire northern half of the colony, uh, derived from simple, rugged homes of the medieval English yeoman, um, going on to describe an enormous chimney occupied an entire end of the house. I should note that also in the WPA publication, there is homage paid to Aisham's work, and so we can assume that this is where the Works Progress Administration, Aisham is where the Works Progress Administration got their 
So the origin of the stone editor as a building type seems both simple and complicated. A single room cell with end chimneys wouldn't have been unfamiliar to the colonists in southern New England, since most of them were British, and this is a common vernacular English house form, albeit constructed differently here because the materials are different. Constructing buildings in this form, a one-room house, possibly one and a half stories in height, with a large stone chimney on one end, makes sense once the colonial builder understands how to use the materials he's found here. But why were I? There are two valuable building materials that occur naturally and abundantly in Rhode Island, stone and lime. Given that these building materials are readily natively available in this region uh, that would later become known as Rhode Island. It's not surprising that the early buildings found here would be constructed of these materials. Masonry building parts, unlike stone walls, require a bonding element, mortar, between and among the masonry units to ensure their structural stability. The most common ingredients of mortar are clay and lime. I'm sorry, here's a map of stone from the 19th century in uh, Rhode Island. It's inverted so it would fit on the slide, but it's incredibly cool and shows you all the different types of um, stone. Uh, Rhode Island, uh, like nearby Plymouth Colony and many parts of Connecticut, has many deposits of usable field stone, especially native deposits of glacial granite and gneiss that could be used to create a masonry structure like a building. Sentence I said priorly about masonry stone walls requiring a bonding agent is now appropriate because we're going to move to lime, which is one of the bonding agents. Um, Rhode Island is rich in two sources of lime. In the northern part of the state, limestone occurs naturally in, a, in, an, in abundant deposits, and quarrying this natural limestone below the ground began in the mid 17th century with the Harris and Dexter families dominating the early in lime industry. And there are reports from the 19th century, here are a couple of clips of the great Harris and Dexter beds of limestone in Lincoln, formerly part of Smithfield. Um, and um, this is where um, that portion of the PRI project became somewhat mind-numbing as I tried to understand what crocodile like right, wad, molly balling, maggot, all those words up there that are totally unfamiliar to me in Beanpole Hill at that Sneech Pond. So there's stuff you didn't know about Rhode Island. In Lincoln, just down the hill actually from the Valentine Whitman House is the Lime Rock Historic District recognized for its role in Rhode Island's early limestone production. In fact, the Com Compton Limestone Quarry, which began as the Harris Quarry mentioned in the previous slide in the mid 17th century, continues in operation today. The lime along the coast, uh, shell mortar, was created by burning shells to create lime carbonate, then slaking them using water and heat to produce calcium hydroxide was in very many cases the earliest type of mortar used in 17th century Rhode Island buildings, probably due to the fact that the middens were located above ground, an easy source of materials. This is a picture of the um, Stata, the whaleback shell midden state historic site, and it still very much looks like this very, very tall uh, layers and layers and layers of oyster shells. Um, while ultimately not as stable as limestone, shell mortar was much less expensive because it didn't involve the below ground quarrying. Uh, it was simply native material that could be burned. Going back to our friend Norman Isham, he pondered the distinction between these two sources of lime in Rhode Island and suggested. So with all this information on hand, how do we identify what really is a stone ender? Some important caveats. A building that has a stone end is not necessarily a stone ender. This is because there is more to understanding stone enders than the presence of stone forming one end of a building. 
There's also the manner of original structural framing and the associated early floor plan that accompanies that stone end, which is distinctive, and the two features can't be uncoupled. More things to consider. The sides of the masonry mass are generally not exposed to the weather. It's just one, one plane. The corners are covered by other uh, features of the side walls. The form of structural framing is often plank framing, but not always. If enlarged, additional rooms would be added at the other gable end of the building, opposite your stone end, or by adding a room and an additional firebox to one side, the rear mostly, of the existing masonry mass. And importantly, line order, which maintains its strength as it is exposed to water and weather, was critical to use on any exposed masonry. And a few more things to know, in particular about chimneys. Not all stone chimneys have survived. By the first quarter of the 18th century, brick chimneys start to come into fashion. Could be tied to the fact that brickworks start to become known in Providence in the late 17th century. Um, the appearance of some stone in buildings becomes confusing when you start to introduce brick at the chimneys. And by the mid 18th century, many Rhode Island houses are built the fashionable center chimneys, which means that many of the earlier houses may well have been changed, added onto, to create the appearance of the more modern center chimney house. Back to the PRI Stone End project. So by now I've identified approximately 60 buildings that may have been stone enders, or that had stone ends, or had stone chimneys, or possibly brick ends started to get a little bit confusing because there was a lot more information than we anticipated and a wide range of it. So I captured all the information in a very complicated and unwieldy database, dates, all different names, current and historic names, uh, uh, literature citations, which books had mentioned which properties, all the different dates that have been purported for the different properties. And what became evident to me was that how a stone ender was being defined over 100 years from Isham to the AF study, or what the RAHPHC inventories indicate, or what our National Register nomination might say, were not all necessarily consistent. So why is that and what to do about it? Um, that is, is one of the questions. One thing that became clear was that I needed to start dividing the buildings into certain types of statuses. Um, some were moved, some were demolished, some were still here but had been restored, some had been altered in certain ways. Some were still here but you couldn't tell what they were. So there are a whole bunch of categories that I created to try to divine what these different buildings uh, now either look like or historically what their, what their status was. And I then uh, took all of that information from the spreadsheet and created individual inventory forms so it's a more user-friendly way to capture um, the information from, from the ginormous spreadsheet. So PRI's project revealed, confirmed, that the stone ender, while not unique to Rhode Island, is nearly so. Uh, close to 60 pre-1740 houses statewide seem to have some form of stone end, while fewer than a dozen have been confirmed in Massachusetts and Connecticut combined. The extraordinary number of potential stone end buildings in Rhode Island is almost certainly related to the three circumstances already mentioned, an abundance of stone, granite specifically, for construction, native sources of lime for mortar, and the likely geographic origins of the settlers and builders, primarily from the northern and western regions of England. Of the 59 buildings identified in the literature, 27 have been demolished. Eight of those demolished seem to be accepted as established stone enders. Two of the 59 were moved, both accepted as established stone enders, and have been categorized as altered or restored by virtue of having been moved. 
that it's removed from their original context and thus missing um, the opportunity to uh, look at original building fabric in its original context. Let's take a quick look at some of the demolished stone enders. Nearly half of the stone end buildings thus far have been demolished, as I mentioned, with the fate of another half dozen or so uh, unclear but almost certainly demolished. Luckily, the Historic American Building Survey recorded some of these and captured historic images or renderings. The Coddington House, 1641 on the left. The Old Pidge Tavern of 1700 in the center. And you can see even early on, it had been transformed from a stone ender into something else. The Fireplace House of 1680 to 1710. These are all talked about in the literature. These are two additional buildings, the Henry Bull House of circa 1638-39 on the left and Roger Moran Tavern of 1653 are talked about quite significantly as being quite significant buildings. And then this one building, um, that survived in its original location until 1973 is the Jacob Mock House in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. It was very, very well studied by Delafin, an architectural historian and early VA effort who has authored numerous books and articles on architectural topics. Upton was able to study the Mott House in great detail. That is, he conducted the field work that I mentioned earlier and subsequently published an article in Full Time New England. What Upton studied, however, was a long demolished one-story building dating to 1640 that was replaced by the building shown here, the Mott House. The smaller building having, he says, enough evidence to suggest its form and to indicate that it had been a stone ender, a distinctive Rhode Island house type with a projecting end chimney similar to those found on the extent Clemens Irons and Thomas Benner houses. So I think what's important about this is the fact that it wasn't actually this building that was, it was actually moved in the 70s that, that up and studied, but it was a core inside this building. Um, and it was some of the most recent field work done on a historic stone ender. A couple of moved stone enders. Um, this is known as the John Trick House. It's on Washington Street here in Newport. It's built in 1725 and located in the Manton area of Providence. Habs recorded the house, which was sub subsequently moved to its current location in the early 1960s. And you can see on the right hand side, which is a Google Street View, because this has been under scaffolding quite a long time, every time I come over to take a photograph, uh, sort of bit of a, an interesting beehive oven possibility. Another moved stone ender is also here in Newport. This one was noted by antiquarians, uh, including Eichen. It's the 1709 Benaya Brown House, originally located in Exeter, North Kingstown. On the left is the image recorded after the 1938 hurricane, uh, with the tree that hit the house removed from its left side. And on the right, you see the house relocated here in Newport to Mill Street by the Newport Restoration Foundation in the early 1970s. Again, I'm not sure any of us walking by these would say these are stone enders. So we have 24 buildings that have survived in some form, and some have historically noted that they are stone enders. Of those, um, 11 have not been confirmed to be stone enders. They haven't been studied, uh, there hasn't been field work. Um, so if we remove those 11 buildings that are not confirmed as stone enders, that leaves 13 buildings as established, Stone enders. Of the 13, 10 retain a recognizable masonry stone or brick end and have thus been cataloged as extant and recognizable. So let's take a look 
had a few of those. We've seen this one before. The Valentine Whitman House, you'll see it again also. It was built by Valentine Whitman Jr. in circa 1696, less than a mile from the Lime Rock Village, well known for its early production of lime, even to this day. What we have to understand about the Valentine Whitman House is it was the McMansion of its day and maybe more. This is a colonial, early colonial house on steroids. Um, this is a very huge, high studded, highly, highly decorated house built of a huge amount of material compared to what other people were living in at the turn of the 17th to 18th century. This is the Thomas Fenner House, 1677, in Cranston. It was hard to photograph, so I cheated and took an image from the Google on the right Airbnb image. Uh, this operates as an Airbnb, so if you want to experience sleeping in a pretty well intact stone ender, it's the Fenner House. It has survived in relatively unaltered condition, unlike most of the early houses. This is one of several Fenner houses identified as being stone enders and the only one to survive. And I'm gonna digress for a minute and let you ponder these two images, both supposedly of the Thomas Fenner house in Cranston. And one obviously copying the other, the painting copying the photograph. Um, but is it the Fenner house that survives? <coughs> Uh, I would say not. Um, I would say this is illustrative of some of the sorting out that continues to need to be done of some of the information that's in certain archives. And um, this is just, you know, clearly not the same house. But an interesting find nonetheless. The Green Bowen House. This is an interesting example in the Puttonwood section of Warwick also known as Fonts Green House. It dates to 1715, so it's turned into the 18th century early. Um, and what we see here really is a later 18th century appearance. This was nominated to the National Register of Historic Places in 1974 uh, and was restored by Steve Tyson, who started the Architectural Preservation Group, a restoration firm, and has worked carefully for years and continues to, under the care of his son, restore historic buildings. The Palmer Northup House, working our way south to Whitford, right across from Smith's Castle on Route 1A, dates to 1709, another hard to photograph building. You can see remnants of the stone end to the right um, in the right photograph. This building has also had later alterations, which make it very hard to discern what's going on but it's certainly a well-known, well-studied, including by the Vernacular Architecture Forum building. And familiar to some of you, um, it's Newport's Elder John Bliss House of circa 1715. This, uh, like the Valentine Whitman House, is a fully elaborated stone ender. It's the highest expression of its type. And if you look closely, in the left, lower left, you can barely see evidence of a bake oven uh, at the lower right side. Excuse me, uh, lower left of the left slide. You've seen this one too. It's the circa 1680 Clements Irons House in Johnston. This is one of the two stone enders purchased and restored by SBNEA in the early 20th century. On the left, you see an early photograph that's preserved in the house collection, and on the right, you see the house today. SBNEA's work on restoration in the early 20th century established how historic preservation should be happening on historic buildings. It continues to be the state of the art approach to restoring buildings peeling back very, very carefully the fabric that, the later fabric that exists, trying to honor the evolution of the building, noting what changes you make, recording every move you make. Um, and Appleton and SBNEA really did set that in motion 
It's evolved over time to respect more of the later fabric, which is partly why both the Clements Irons and the Arnold House in this project were categorized as altered buildings, because restoration really does alter buildings. Uh, even though the intention is good, to bring it back to an earlier presentation, you lose a lot of fabric and you can lose information uh, in, in the course of working on buildings uh, that way. The Elegazer Arnold House is the second of those buildings. Uh, this is on the Great Road in Lincoln, uh, dates to 1687, uh, and it's the second house that uh, William Sumner Appleton purchased for SPMEA in the early decades of the 20th century. One remarkable retained feature uh, is the pile string at the top of the chimney, which heightens the perception of this building, certainly as um, having medieval roots. So let's go back just briefly and look at a few of the 11 properties, the unconfirmed properties, so that you understand a little more complicated, a little, little better how complicated this project got at moments in time. Here's the Joseph Smith House in North Providence. Like several others you've seen, Cranston, Warwick, Clemens Irons, and Johnston, this is located in an area of suburban and commercial development. And if you aren't looking for it, you'll certainly miss it. Also like the others, the appearance that you're seeing is certainly not what would have been present when it was built in circa 1750. We're seeing much more of the mid 18th century additions that were made to the house. But at one end, on the left, you see a stone wall above which is brick. Curious, not clear quite what's going on. And as I mentioned earlier, we know brick works are happening in Providence in the late uh, 17th century. Perhaps some changes made to this building. The Smith House is individually listed on the National Register, happened in 1978. And this should, should give us a lot of historic and architectural background and should establish the significance of the building. But like other studies, uh, listing on the National Register doesn't necessarily mean that the building has been forensically examined through field work. It hasn't been investigated in the way that uh, might reveal what the structure, structural framing, floor plan are. But I will say, oops, the NR nomination is clear about building's plan, stone wall, stone end wall, and stone end chimney. So I think perhaps there's more to learn about this. This is one of the buildings that was not on that original list of a dozen or so that we all understood to be preserved stone enders. Another building that turns up in the literature but nowhere on the list of known stone enders is the Sheffield House in uh, Charlestown, in the southern part of, of the state, South County, the states between 1685 and 1713. It, too, is listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which documents extensive changes that occurred to the house over time. Another one, because it's not on that original list, but is noted in early literature, is worth taking another look at. The Samuel Perry House was built between 1696 and 1716 in the Matunic area of South Kingstown, mm -hmm. also in South Kingstown. Curry is another interesting example of a house that does, in fact, appear to be a stone ender, but wasn't identified as such. Hysham and Downing note the house, and in 2014, the New England chapter of the Vernacular Architecture Forum included the house on one of its field tours as representative of the stone end type. Isham called it the church house. He dismisses this as a stone ender because of the lean-to. He says the church house with its stone chimney at the end of the main room. This chimney, however, is not really an end chimney, for it has a fireplace at the back that, of that in the main room with a summer in, summer in, in a one-story lean-to. The only stone end houses in all South County, so far as we have explored or have received trustworthy reports, 
appear, appear to be near Whitford, the Palmer Northup House, which I showed you earlier, and the Brown House, which was moved to Newport. Downing calls it Perry House and talks about the evolution of another house that Eichen is restoring and elaborates on the practice of adding chimney lean-to. Finally, there's the Edward Searle have The Edward Searle House in Cranston, again mentioned in the literature, dated to 1677 by the State Preservation Office, was originally apparently constructed in 1670 and rebuilt after King Philip's War, presumably on the same foundation. What we see today includes 1720 alterations, but also includes, as you can see in this left-hand elevation, some portion of the stone wall. And finally, this is the George Douglas House in Saunderstown, a part of North Kingstown. It's a very late date for a true stone ender. It was built in circa 1738 and restored in the 1940s. But take a look at what's going on here. It's a pretty large chimney on the end of a building, a very smallish house. I'd like us to know more about this building which has passed by thousands of cars. Many of you may have driven by this um, uh, daily. And it keeps catching my eye just when the sun is right. And I think somebody needs to look at this. So to conclude, back to our Valentine Whitman House. Preserve Rhode Island's review of this rare Rhode Island building type confirms that the Valentine Whitman House is indeed a remarkable and rare survivor. It was constructed as a two-story house, VAX Type E, a fully elaborated stone ender. It was recorded by Habs, I'm not sure, I don't remember the year. A comparison here shows the Valentine Whitman on the left and the Arnold House on the right, nearby Arnold House, of almost the exact same date, within three years of each other. Valentine Whitman being 1696, Arnold 1693. The building's original structural framing remains nearly fully intact from attic to cellar. And you can see in almost every room um, all of the structural beams exposed, being not only exposed but extravagantly decorated. First and second story rooms all include the elegant carving called chamfering. More chamfering. And lots of other historic elements well intact that help us weave the story of the Valentine Whitman together over its 300 years, including the flat and incredible hardware. It is also one of the only 17th century Rhode Island confirmed stone enders that escaped enlargement, the other one being the Thomas Fenner House in Cranston. It started out its life significantly larger than many, many other documented stone enders and certainly other houses of other types being built um, shortly thereafter. It was never added onto. Think hard if you've seen a 300-year-old building in your travels that never, ever had an addition. This building is just remarkable um, for that point alone, if not all the others. <laughs> so the PRI Stone Ender Project confirmed without a doubt how really special the Valentine Moon House is as an intact and advanced specimen of Rhode Island's early approach to dwelling construction.
question was how did they move the houses that were moved? So actually house moving is quite an art and it's probably a dying art at this point because people just seem to raise them these days under the R-A-Z-D. But house moving actually was quite um, comfortably done um, throughout the 19th century. Um, I can't tell you technically how, but if you Google 19th century house moving, that I should know because I actually, when I was at SPNEA, um, and I want to digress for one quick minute and say, SPNEA is an amazing organization, historic New England now, um, and uh, I'm delighted tonight to have two people who work at the Redwood who I used to work with at SPNEA, historic New England. Uh, so this is an organization that has very wide tentacles. Um, we did move a house actually in, in Springfield, Massachusetts, and they put them on rollers, and they, they have very big beams, and they lift them up very, very carefully, and they move them very slowly over days and days and days. Um, now, that said, um, I am not sure about these particular two buildings. These were done in the later 20th century, right, 1960 and 1970s. My guess is they disassembled and labeled parts and moved them down to parts and reconstructed them. That would be my guess. Any other questions? Great. Now we can have drinks. <laughs> Thank you, Shanti.